tonight's shocking allegations against the city's top cop. Former detective Russell Poole has filed suit against the department. Poole says he uncovered dirty cops while investigating the murders of rappers Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur. I provided the chief with enough uh, information and evidence that would warrant a full uh, probe. And at that meeting, I was ordered not to uh, investigate any further. Los Angeles, California. We're driving to meet ex-detective Russell Poole at his lawyer's office. Ex-detective Poole resigned after 18 years on the force when he was prevented from investigating fellow police officers whom he believed to be involved in the murders of Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur. Russell Poole is currently suing the Los Angeles Police Department. Russell believes that the whole thing started because Suge Knight owed Tupac millions of dollars in royalties. Tupac was about to leave death row and audit them, and that was why he was murdered. Hello, Elvis. Russell now follows developments with the case on his computer. Is he one of your favorites? Yeah, I, I do like Russell was an apple pie, all-American kind of cop. His father, an ex-marine and ex-sheriff, was his hero and role model. Russell is one of those cops who says he bleeds blue. He's an old-school type of cop. So it's great we were able to do this, finally. Yeah, well, don't tell Leo. Uh -oh. <laughs> Would you get that on? <laughs> Leo would be pissed. And do you think that there was a connection between the Tupac Shakur killing and the Biggie Smalls killing? Well, that's uh, basically what it appears to be, uh, a retaliation, okay? And I think Suge Knight wanted it to, uh, to look that way, okay? But, uh, you know, had we been able to aggressively investigate and uh, had the heart to uh, connect the two and, uh, and do a thorough investigation, I think we probably would have found out more information. And why didn't you? Well, you know, there's a lot of factors, but uh, I think the fact that law enforcement officers were working for death row, and that was a scandal in itself, okay? Uh, the fact that law enforcement officers were working for gangsters, known felons, uh, uh, basically organized crime, because it, it was no secret that Death Row Records uh, was involved in drug trafficking. Between 30 and 40 police officers, some of whom are seen here, worked off duty for Death Row. Suge Knight had a lot of power, even within the DA's office. Suge Knight to me he was one of the most powerful gangsters around. He was well organized, he had a lot of power, and uh, what gave him the power is he had dozens and dozens of police officers working in his organization, okay? He also uh, had a DA that was uh, uh, working on his uh, Who was that? matters. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Larry Longo. Russell believes that Tupac's murder was organized by Suge Knight to look like a gang killing between the Crips and the Pyrus, also known as the Bloods. It was the night of the Tyson fight at the MGM in Las Vegas. Here he is being congratulated by Tupac and Suge Knight. Prior to the fight, Tupac was walking across the casino when one of Suge Knight's Pyru homies whispered into Tupac's ear that a Crip was standing nearby. This Crip, Orlando Anderson, was supposed to have stolen a death row medallion. Tupac, keen to impress, rushed over and punched Orlando Anderson, knocking him to the ground. Suge Knight joined in with the kicking. It was for this kicking, a parole violation, that Suge Knight would receive nine years in prison. Two hours later, Tupac would be mortally wounded, fighting for his life. Russell thinks Suge Knight staged the whole casino incident. He thought he would be able to beat this casino probation thing. He really did. It just 
backfired on him. There's no nothing he can do for his defense because the whole reason for that setup in the casino was to provide a motive, you know, for uh, Compton Crips to do the hit on Tupac when, in fact, Suge Knight's people that he hired was going to do the hit. See, it's very smart. I mean, if you study any of these uh, mafia flicks, uh, I mean, it's just perfect. Russell referred us to ex-police officer Hackey, one of the law enforcement officers who worked for Death Row. Hackey was one of Tupac's personal bodyguards. He now operates from here in San Pedro. Ex-officer Hackey works from here as a bounty hunter. He had himself just been released from prison. Hello. John, how you doing? Hackey was incarcerated for having a trunk full of AK-47s. So, um, so when did you actually get out? Uh, actually, to be exact, I was released on the 14th of January. 14th of January? Yeah. This is Hackey as a police officer and plumper, Dunkin' Donut Days. He was a Compton police officer for about 14 years. I asked him if being a police officer and working for a criminal organization wasn't a bit of a contradiction. I, I think primarily uh, Death Row Records, uh, in a sense, hired individual officers, I mean, who were, in a sense, officers who would, you know, as I say, we see but we don't see. But isn't that a compromise? In a sense, I mean, most departments have off-duty work policy. Um, so it's all right to see drugs when you're off-duty and it's I, not all right I, when I you're on-duty? I, I can honestly say... As, I would say that that was compromised. A, as man as my witness isn't upstairs. That, isn't that the word compromise? Based on the statement you said, yes, but I have never seen any but drugs. Were, but you were aware, you said? There was... I had heard, okay. but I have never seen anything with my own eyes. Well, and, we're going backwards because you were aware about 30 seconds ago. I, I, I was aware of certain things, but I, I've never seen any drugs. Right. No. Hackey witnessed heated money disputes between Tupac and Suge Knight. At the time of his death, Tupac was owed over $10 million by death row. Just before his murder, Tupac told Hackey and others he'd be leaving death row and taking unreleased songs worth more millions with him. Hackey regards these as the real motives for Tupac's murder. He complained, though, that my questions were too vague. So you think what? You think I should be more specific? Be, be more specific and direct with your questions. Okay, do you think Suge Knight orchestrated the hit? Saved by the pager. <laughs> uh, based upon what I've been told, within the industry and based on what I knew for a fact that was going on. Uh, so Tupac was leaving a record company, okay, because Tupac didn't need Suge Knight. He'd had other, several other offers. Um, I would have to say in a sense that he had something to do with the orchestration of the shooting of Tupac. So tell me, do you think that the two murders, the two killings, were connected? Biggie Smalls and... Tupac? My personal opinion again. Um, yes, I, I believe they're both connected. And do you think the same person was responsible for orchestrating the two? Yes. And that person's in Death Row Records? Yes. So why do you think uh, Biggie was killed. I think, in a sense, uh, Christopher Wallace just happened to be. Yeah, he's a well-known rap artist. But I think basically he just happened to, based on the situation transpired with Tupac, the flame was lit. So in order to throw the attention off Death Row Records, this man was killed. Next by saying it was an East-West rivalry. Let's make it seem as if Bad Boy Records had something to do with the shooting of Tupac Shakur, which by no means whatsoever was the, remotely the case. This is Shug Knight at his death row offices. 
I wondered if he was the victim of his own gangster posturings, the diamond earrings, the Havana cigar. This is the Shug Knight, custom-made electric chair. And then there was a statement Shug Knight made about him and Tupac, seen here minutes before they were shot at. Shug Knight didn't help his credibility by saying he had a bullet stuck in his head, when in fact medical evidence showed he was only scratched by a piece of flying glass. Let me ask you something. You were hit as well in that car. Mm-hmm. Are you doing okay today? I can see you're injured. I got a bullet still in my head. The bullet's still in your head? Yes. The doctor told me that um, they did brain scans, all kind of stuff. And it went in and cracked my cranium. And it stayed there. They said there'd be more chances for damage to try to take it out to sew it up. I was I was hit there, I was grazed <clears throat> some other places. I got a deep slash or bullet grazed the back of my neck, which if if it went another inch, it'd hit my spine and paralyzed me. Suge oh, Knight appeared to celebrate his history of violence. Rumors that he dangled vanilla rice by the ankles, charges of violent assault, attempted murder, the reports of daily beatings at his offices. After a semi-successful football career, Suge Knight had reinvented himself as a mob Piru gang member, dressing in the blood colors, surrounding himself with a posse of ex-con Piru gang members. The mob Pyrus come from Compton in L.A., also the home of their rival gang, the Crips. Suge Knight was born and grew up in this area, the area of the mob Pyrus. It was in this street that he played as a kid. He said he used to see bodies in the alley on his way home, and one has to ask how growing up in Compton affected Suge Knight. See you later. This is Reggie Wright Sr., chief gangs officer. He said the gang warfare in Compton was so intense, he'd witnessed the genocide of almost an entire generation. My mother's bedridden. I had to come in here and say hi to my sister and keep up with her. Reggie was the most cheerful gang officer we'd ever met. So you said the mob started here. It was Well, actually, this house right here to my right is one of the leaders of it. Used to live. These kids, these are the good guys on the street. They don't get in any trouble, right, guys? Turn your butt around. I'll act like you don't want to be seen. Any other time, you right out here, right out in the front. Let them see what the good guys look like from the neighborhood. I know. Hello, man. All right. These are some of the kids that live over here. But quite frankly, the guy in the yellow, <laughs> his dad, is one of the original Ma Pirus. And matter of fact, his dad was present that night at the casino when they had that you incident. You mean Tupac? Uh, because he worked with uh, Shug, uh, when the McDonald's, so. Tupac's murder caused massive gang warfare in Compton between the Pyrus and the Crips. The death row explanation of events was that Biggie and Bad Boy were aligned with the Crips, whereas Suge Knight, Tupac, and Death Row were with the Pyrus. Gang loyalty is the most important thing in Compton. To be called a snitch is to be as good as dead. Suge Knight lived over in this area here, over on this side of town. He never really claimed any particular gang or stuff because he was in the football at the time and going up. But the guys he grew up with and the gangster type guys are, are guys from this mob area over here. And uh, naturally, when he got into his business and started the Death Row label, a lot of those guys wanted jobs from him and wanted to identify with him. And he hired them to work along with him. Uh, Tupac, when he became part of Death Row, a lot of the guys that were doing uh, work with Death Row are, are more or less part of the Death Row entourage came from this area here. So naturally, when Tupac was killed, these guys, you know, took offense to that. And that's when we had the retaliation. After Tupac's murder, there were over 20 shootings in Compton over a 10-day period between the Pyrus associated with Death Row and the Crips. There's no evidence that the Crips were working with Biggie and Bad Boy at the time of Tupac's murder. The so-called gang war is regarded by Hackey and ex-detective Paul as being used to take attention away from Suge Knight's involvement in Tupac and Biggie's murder.
This is Tupac at the Milan Fashion Shows. We're going to see Frank Alexander back left, who was with Tupac when he was murdered. Frank Alexander appeared to be the fall guy. Despite the incident with the crib at the MGM, Frank was the only bodyguard assigned to Tupac that night. He was unarmed and did not have a radio. When he refused to lie about the incident, Frank received death threats. Frank now lives on this horse ranch in Orange County. Hello. Good. Hi, how do you do? Very good. Um, good to see you. What's your name? Nick, Nick. Nick Broomfield. Oh, hi, Nick. <laughs> hi. So you, this is the UK so you were, crew, huh? Yeah. So you were <laughs> Tupac's bodyguard? Yeah. yeah. Frank, a former Mr. Universe, terrified by the death threats, found spiritual peace when he became a born again Christian. He also got several Rottweilers to back him up in case all else failed. Frank put on his favorite cowboy suit. Frank spent the year following Tupac's death severely depressed. He smoked a lot of dope and contemplated suicide. Frank wrote a book about his experiences as Tupac's bodyguard called Got Your Back. So, and what, what do you think, I mean, you, you mentioned in your book that there were, you know, rumors that it was an inside job. Um, I never mentioned in my book that there was rumors of an inside job because uh, I had been on vacation prior to uh, going back uh, that day to Las Vegas to work and I think I think the exact phrase you used in your book was that there were rumors that Suge Knight had orchestrated the killing I didn't even say that oh, in my book. okay so this is an exact quote from your book okay okay it says word circulated that the shooting was orchestrated by Shook. Word circulated. I think it did not circulate for me saying anything. No, no, no. About. I said that that was a quote from the book. Okay. Word um, circulated. That it has circulated that Shook had something to do with it. That the shooting was orchestrated. The killing was orchestrated by Shook. By Shook. Uh huh. You're going to let the dogs on me? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, because I think in the book you also said that you 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 were frightened that Suge wanted to kill you. Um, it wasn't that Suge himself or had anyone say that he wanted to kill me. I was getting death threats. I got death threats uh, indirectly through employees that were still at right way, people that I knew that were friends of mine. Other policemen, though. Um, I never heard it from a police um, officer saying that. Um, you know, I was going to be killed or anything like that, but I was told by um, LAPD and also by Las Vegas uh, Metro to watch my back and to be careful, you know, because possibly something could happen to me. I just wondered why you wrote that you were frightened of Suge and that Suge wanted to kill you. I didn't say that Suge wanted to kill me. Well, I could, a, a I could friend, give you another quote. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you on that. A friend of mine called me and said, Suge wants you dead. I go, what? He goes, DR. I go, DR? He goes, yes, Death Row Records wants you dead, which I have uh, on tape. I have it recorded. Frank and Tupac were close. Frank also gave us this video hit shot of Tupac with his niece, Lamaika. Tupac called Frank, Frankie. Yeah, tell Frankie to call me. <laughs> Frankie, you call me when she tells you to call me Frankie. <laughs> Frankie goes to Hollywood. Hey, yo, Frankie. Frankie! Yo, Frankie! What are you calling this from? What? Y'all call him Frankie? Nah, we gonna call him Frankie. Only, only our family call us that. Call me Ella, Mika. Up your sexy pussy sleeves. The horrors of Tupac's murder are at best inconclusive, but there are inconsistencies that beg further questions. We know who's responsible for this. 
The problem we have with this case is we don't have anyone willing to come forward and testify to it. If you knew who killed Tupac, would you tell the police? Absolutely not. I mean, because you know I don't Why know. not? Because it's, it's not my job. I don't get paid to solve homicides. I don't get paid to tell people. Other than the fictitious bullet in the head, further questions need to be asked about events the night of Tupac's murder. Why, for example, was Frank Alexander asked by death row to say that Orlando Anderson the Crip had snatched a chain from Tupac the night before the fight, when in fact that wasn't true? I was just asked um, concerning Orlando Anderson to say that uh, we, Tupac and I, had seen him earlier uh, at the MGM when we were over there and uh, Tupac was gambling, um, to say that he had snatched off a, a chain off of Tupac's neck. If we have a homicide and we know that it was something that was planned, we're going to start interviewing people, you know, whether it's weeks, months, or years prior, basically whatever it takes to find the inception of that plan. Whose idea was it to kill this person? Why did they want them dead? And when did they start talking about it? To me, prior to leaving, was he's not going to be in Vegas. I don't have to worry about him showing up. And don't worry about it because he won't be there. He did not want to go to Vegas. Matter of fact, he fought off going to Vegas all the way to the last second. And when I got there, I was surprised to see him there. Because he had told us that he was not going there with his words, them sell out niggas. I was told by another one of our security guards that was a bodyguard that he had escorted Pot to the airplane as they were leaving New York. And Tupac told him, specifically told him, that he was a dead man walking. I told us not to carry any weapons. Never have they told me to leave my weapons, either in my room or my car. So they were asking us to guard Pac and Shook and everyone else completely armed. We had never been told to leave our weapons. Why would I leave my weapons? in a vehicle or in the hotel room and I'm personally guarding Pac in one of the most hottest places to be. And what that's going to make it is a body guarding incident where you would be, only thing you would have on you is your person. And Michael Moore made the, you know, biggest, uh, you know, who are about the weapons. I informed Reggie that I wasn't taking my weapon off for no one. The dog, my gun did not belong to right way. It was my personal gun, and I was going to carry it, and that's what I did. When he, when he died, I was just like, whoa. You know what I'm saying? It kind of took me by. I mean, even though we was going through our drama, I would never wish death on nobody, you know what I'm saying? Because there ain't no coming back from that. So it kind of turned me down a little bit. But at the same time, you know, you got to move on. You know, I felt for his moms, for his family or whatever, but, you know, things got to move on, you know? Biggie was murdered a week after doing that interview. So what then happened? Once Tupac was murdered, why was Biggie next? Hackey said it was to take attention off death row. Was it aimed against Puffy to take away his most valuable asset? Or was it just that the killing machine was in place and the killing couldn't stop? We went back to Orange County to see ex-detective Russell Poole. He did a lot of the groundwork on the Biggie murder. So, and tell me, was uh, Kevin Hackey one of your main sources of information? Yes, he is. He, he was a main source of information, and his uh, information was worthy of follow-up. And, and, uh, and when I tried to follow up on that information, I was stopped and ordered not to uh, go any further. This toilet bowl sketch was placed on Russell's desk when he insisted on investigating fellow LAPD officers. The piece of excrement marks his place as D1 detective. Russell was then removed from the case. It affected him very deeply. I almost took my life, uh, uh, but it was my kids that uh, actually saved me, okay? And uh, it hurt. I was betrayed by my own department because of the core values that the Los Angeles Police Department preached from day one. Honesty, integrity, okay, tell the truth, swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth so help you God, do a good job, do a thorough investigation, 
worked for the community. Uh, I believed in the oath of office. I, I believed in the protect and serving the people. I really did. But on the inside, behind closed doors, that it wasn't the case. When it came to cops being investigated, it, it, we weren't serving the public the way we should have served the public. Biggie was murdered on March the 9th, 97, six months after Tupac. He was leaving the Vibe Party at the Peterson Motor Museum in Los Angeles. It was a well-orchestrated hit. You got to ask yourself one question. Why haven't uh, these cases been solved? One reason that, that they were well-orchestrated, well-planned out, radios being used, communication, and had to be experienced people doing this, which would lead you to believe that experienced police officers knew exactly what to do. Russell suspected police officer David Mack for orchestrating and organizing the hit using scanners and radios that were later found in his house. Officer Rafael Perez, Officer Mack's former partner and best friend, who was convicted for the sale of drugs, racketeering and falsifying evidence. Officer Kevin Gaines, who was having an affair with Suge Knight's wife Sharita, who was later killed by a fellow LAPD officer in a road rage incident. Russell also suspected Harry Billups, a.k.a. Amma Mohammed, as a possible hitman. He's godfather to Officer Mack's kids. Officer Mack was later convicted for this bank robbery. You had a witness in Biggie's entourage who identified David Mack as being at the Peterson Museum. Uh, the car used in the case was a black SS Chevy Impala, and, uh, and David Mack owned one of those. The fact that David Mack took family illness days off prior, just prior to the Biggie Smalls case, which indicates there, was, there had to be some, what of some planning, and he couldn't be uh, uh, bothered with going to work. Uh. Officers Mack, Perez, and Gaines were part of a bigger police scandal, the Rampart scandal, linking officers throughout the LAPD to various forms of corruption. Officer Mack was born and grew up in the same area of Compton as Suge Knight. He's also a self-confessed member of the mob Pyrus. Here he is wearing the colors of the Pyrus. Officers Mack and Perez did everything together. Their loyalty was always to each other. Police officers Mack and Perez used to pick up girls at lap dancing bars. It was there that they also met someone called the bookkeeper, who is now himself in jail. It had been very hard to meet the bookkeeper. We were told that he'd been moved to another jail, that he suffered from Tourette's syndrome, that he was manically depressed and didn't want to see anyone, and that he feared he'd be killed if he spoke to us. This is Ron Siebold, his lawyer. This is Mark Hyland, the bookkeeper. He's up for 37 counts of impersonating a lawyer. In, um, in February of 96, um, several LAPD officers, including um, Rafael Perez, Nito uh, Durden, and David Mack, um, were at Fritz's in Balfour, which is a gentleman's club, a, a topless bar. And at that meeting was also um, a gentleman, um, a, a rapper, um, Suge, Suge Knight, and some of his other associates and everything. And there was, in a nutshell, there was there was a hit taken out on um, Notorious B.I.G. They we're talking about planning on, on how to get the monies and the weapons together. Um, one of the individuals, I, I'm, I do not recall who said, why don't we just get them from evidence like you normally do? And they all kind of laughed and 
chuckled and everything at that point. My jaw about dropped, realizing that, yeah, there's a lot of booze going around here and a lot of drugs going around, but these guys seem, they seem very serious. I mean, they, they were serious. Um, subsequently, um, I, I got immunity on this, right? Triple immunity. <clears throat> um, basically, um, I then, um, I transported, um, uh, Mark, you have federal immunity. This is what we talked about before right. these people came in. Right. You do not have district attorney. You do not have immunity from the state. Okay? Okay. Um, but I, 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 I transported monies interstate between Los Angeles and Phoenix to arrange the hit on, on Big Biggie Small. And how many times would you say that you met with, with Suge Knight? Just a few. Just okay. a few. I never, I never sat down and I never really knew who he was. I mean, I just knew that he demanded a lot of respect from people. Um, it wasn't until recently that I, I learned who, really who he is and, and what he's done. And it, that's why, like I said, I wish I was making, making it all up because I don't know what my life is going to be when I get out. And why did you decide to come forward with this information? Guilt. It was wrong. And I didn't want to be involved anymore. Jackie just informed us he was working as an undercover FBI agent a year before Tupac was killed. According to Hackey, FBI agents and ATN agents were in cars just behind Tupac on the night he was shot. Hackey claims he was betrayed by the FBI. He wasn't given the promotion he was promised, and they then let him languish in jail. Howdy. We'd caught Hackey on the hop. I said around 11. You guys doing okay? Yeah. Yourself? I can't complain. It's been a good day. So far. Hackey says he has the documents to prove his claims. No bail. No, no. So, did you manage to get those uh, documents you mentioned? Yeah, I managed. Yeah, I told you I didn't get the documents. That's an uh, issue. My attorney's working on a thing. I'm working on something. She wants. Are we on tape? No. We can wait. What's so amazing about these documents? Uh, put it to you this way. Oops. I've already been offered a quarter of a million dollars. Okay. A quarter of a million dollars for what? These documents. Actually, really? Yeah. From who? Come on now. What? Oh, you got the camera on me again. Quarter of a million dollars, that's a lot of money. I told you, man, this for money. I mean, excuse my French, I got bullshit. I got fuck off money. I ain't worried about that. Fuck I told you I'm money. I'm saying I got that kind of money. You know, that's what I'm saying? I got that kind of... I told you I'm not hurting for money. I'm not a millionaire, but I'm far from hurting for money. Remember, I told you that before. Good morning. Good morning. There's certain documentations which indicate certain people who were involved all along, certain people... In the killing of Biggie. I would say that'd be a true statement, okay? And there's certain people within the DA's office who've known about these things all along. Now, whether or not someone's actually going to pinpoint that an actual ex-officer killed Biggie, I don't know if they'll ever be able to prove that. But as far as the person who actually did the shooting, 
as far as I'm concerned, I believe, I believe probably within um, 24 hours or even two weeks max, I could have the person in custody, guaranteed who the person is. Okay, and LAPD has known this all along. And is this the guy that Russell Poole thinks is responsible, Harry Billups? Uh, I, I, would, I would say yes on that. Don't ask me why or how do I know this and that. I refuse to answer that, okay? But uh, I, would, I would say it's a good guess. It's a good, I'd say 99%. This is the police composite of Biggie's hitman. And this is Russell's main suspect, Harry Billups, a.k.a. Amal Mohammed, who to this day has never been questioned by the LAPD. He's known to Shug, he's known to Reggie. He's known to a handful of LAPD officers, which have obviously come about in the Rampart scandal, and obviously uh, uh, the other individual, which is in federal prison now for the bank robbery. So, I mean, in a sense... Who's David uh, Mack? Yeah. So Perez's right. partner. Oh, you want me to clarify? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, in a sense, there's just too many, I guess, in a sense, in a whole scenario, whether it be Tupac's killing or uh, Christopher's killing, I mean, there's just, there's too many dots that are connecting. But isn't that a bit vague? I mean, connecting dots, you can't really make an arrest on you, you, that. Exactly, you it's can't really make an arrest. It's, it's, it's just an allegation. It's just an allegation, but again, but LAPD maybe, is sitting on a major piece of the puzzle. And why haven't they done anything about it? You, you know what? I, I don't know. Why, why was Russell Poole taken off the case when he originally brought, hey, Chief, you know, there's corruption. Stuff's been going long gone in the department. Let's move Russell somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? Why are a lot of things done? This is the video of Little C's, who was with Biggie when he was shot, and who provided the police composite. After many failed attempts to get Little C's, Valletta, Biggie's mum, took over. This is Miss Wallace. This is Miss Wallace. I'm fine, thank you. Did C's leave us yet? Yeah. <laughs> Don't you dare park on the other side. Park over here. And finally, here was little C's, the main witness to the murder. How are you? How are you doing, you all right? I'm all right. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> all right? Hey, how you doing, all right? All right. Biggie's ashes are kept here in this urn, in his old house where Valletta now lives. See what he does the first thing he came with? What's that? What's that? Huh? I had to go just, you know, speak to my boy real fast. How you doing, yo? I'm doing okay. Yeah, what? That's the urn. So every time he comes in, he got to go over there and, yeah, and touch it. Yeah. So this was, that's Christopher's little heart of everybody that, you know, he was associated and affiliated with. This was, he meant a lot to my son, and that, those were my son's words. I asked Little C's where he was sitting in the car with Biggie. Yeah, I was right behind him. He was in the passenger, he was in the passenger seat, and I was right behind him in the back seat. I was right there, seat. yeah. And what did you see? I just, seen, I just seen the car just roll up and just start shooting in there. One dude in the car by himself. You know what I'm saying? I was sitting outside the window, you know, I was looking out the window and the car just rolled up, stopped right there on the angle of us and started shooting in the car. He only shot through a big door, you know. You know, this was something that whoever did it, they had to see all that and they had to plan it, you know, because it happened, it, it happened too good. And it, it was a, it was police out there. They, they shut the party down from a fire drill, so it was police there. These are FBI photos. The amazing thing is that Biggie and Puffy were under surveillance at the time of the murder. So did you see the FBI? Yeah, I saw them. And, and, and after, after Biggie, after the Biggie death, you know, I had spoke to a couple of police, and I saw a couple of pictures that they had when they was watching us. They were showing me pictures of me, asking me who I'm, who is that? 
Don't tell them that's me. And they asked me, who was that? That's Biggie's best friend, D-Rock. That's, that's him. what they were showing you. So they were showing us pictures when they was followers and this and that. And they showed, the, they, they showed, they were showing old pictures that, you know, that was in this house that the police had in L.A. So, you know, I was thinking, like, God damn, you know, something real fishy is going on. I called the FBI agent who took the photos. Hello? Oh, hello. Is that Detective... It would be, yes. Um... I was wondering if I could talk to you because um, I understand that you were following uh, Biggie Smalls and Puffy Coombs at the time that um, Biggie's... Uh, Who are you? My name's uh, Nick Broomfield. Yeah. And um, I, I was just... Uh, I saw some photographs that I believe you might have taken and I was wondering if I could hey, talk... What do you do for a living? I'm uh, a uh, documentary filmmaker. Okay. Uh, let me call you back. I'm in court right now. Call you a little later. I discovered he was attending Puffy's trial for the nightclub shooting. Will be on. No, I was just wondering what, you know, what it was that you were investigating at the time. Right. Um, well, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't discuss it with you. Oh, you wouldn't discuss it? No. Be good. E even though it was some time ago? Well, it hasn't finished yet. It hasn't finished? Where'd you get my number? Where'd you get my number? Sorry? Where'd you get my number? Where did I get your number? In 1993, a Senate Select Committee was set up to look into the hip-hop movement. Fear of its inflammatory qualities led to FBI surveillance. And your number was one of the numbers I was given. As somebody, you know, who was very, who was actually following uh, Biggie at the time that he was, who was, he was shot and who might be able to give me some information. Who gave you my number? You know, I just... Sorry? Who gave you my number? I really, I really don't know offhand who that was. Okay, well, when you figure it out, beat me. I'll call you back and we'll talk. Okay. We went back to tell Valletta about the conversation. My son was just a little upcoming rapper in California. Um, for a, 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 an award. FBI was following him. Were they following him here in New York City? Up there in California? Everywhere he was going? Why? I would like to know why. Miss Wallace would like to know why. If FBI was following my son, where were they that night my son was shot? And why is it, if they weren't there, why is it that moment, that night, they were taken off? Those are questions that needed to be looked into. Those are investigations that need to be looked into. Biggie was unaware of what was going on. This was Biggie a couple of days before he was shot. How did it get to that day where you got to watch your back and that bodyguard? I mean, it's not just with rappers, you know what I'm saying? People want to attack anybody. That's a large figure, you know what I'm saying? They did it to Jordan, they did it to Tyson, they did it to Bill Cosby, you know what I'm yep, saying? Right. They're going to attack you if you're on top, you know what I'm saying? It's just your job to bob and weave, you know what I'm saying? We applied to Suge Knight's prison to get permission to film. In the meantime, the latter put us in touch with Biggie's bodyguard. The letter said he had a strange encounter when he was standing with Puffy just before Biggie got shot. Gene, the bodyguard, lives here in Upper Manhattan. I heard he was at least six foot seven. Knocking like that, you gotta do something about scared. <laughs> he was knocking like you were scared, man. <laughs> scared? Yeah. How do you do? I'm good. I asked Gene why Biggie's friends hadn't been more cooperative with the police. I wouldn't be talking to you if it wasn't for Miss Wallace. Yeah. You understand? Know if she wasn't pouring her hard crying, I wouldn't be saying jack shit to you. You understand? I think, yeah, some of the other people in the whole crew should have came forward. Yeah, I believe that. 
You understand? Because I believe Big is uh, turning over in his grave because people ain't coming to the forefront for his mother. He, they knew he loved his mother. He cared for his mother, whatever like that. You understand what I'm saying? Everybody do. Everybody care for their mom. You understand? And I just believe that maybe some people should have came forward and then maybe people just want to just say, listen, I'm going to leave this shit alone. You know, that's their own choice. I'm going to eat, man. You know what I'm saying? Bad boy, biggie, whoever, whatever. If I got to shovel shit for a living, I'm going to eat. I showed Gene the police composites of the hitman. So do you, uh, do you recognize any of these pictures here? This is the individual that... That one. This one right here. That one. Yeah. That's the one Lucie's did for the police. That's him right there. That's him? Yeah. That's him. That's the guy that came up to me. That guy? Wait, that guy. That guy right there. That's him? Yeah. Were you ever shown his picture before? That's definitely him, though. Yep. Well, that's Harry Billups, isn't it? That's who? He's called Harry Billups. Amir, or Amir Mohammed, right? That's his name. That was the guy. You can really remember a face that well, wow. You'd be surprised why. I can remember a face. You can? Yeah. Yeah. I believe you, actually. Mm hmm I had him to the teeth before um, P called me that morning. He said, a guy in the nation of Islam shot big and i said your dog he had the blue suit blue bow tie white shirt peanut head receding hairline brown skin he was like yeah dog how you know i said a nigga came up to me first i said he came to us first he walked up the puff van and i got him off and he was like get the fuck out of here i was like yeah straight up for real he came up there first. It's amazing the police never showed you that still picture before. Can't recall him. Nope. They never showed it to you before. They showed me a lot of other shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But they, they absolutely never showed you that picture. I can't recall him showing me that picture. Hi, Russell. We went to play Gene's oh. interview to Russell. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. We got this big Morning. tape recorder. <laughs> Who have we got on today? Stevie Nicks. Ah. Oh. Oh, I'm pleased we got you in your shorts finally. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> mm -hmm. This guy had a stronger street uh, cheekbone structure, whereas that he looked a little sterner look. Right there. And he still works that's for the him. probation. That's yeah. him looking at the, the line up. That's, okay. that's the guy that came up to me. That guy. That guy right there. Okay, so we got a witness saying David Mack was there, and now we got a witness saying Harry Billups that's was there. That's definitely him, though. Amir Muhammad, a.k.a. Amir Muhammad. Yep. It's amazing. What, what do you make of that? I think it's, uh, it's a breakthrough in the case. I think uh, this is another example of how incomplete the investigation is and how they have uh, tried everything or done everything to avoid the truth in the matter. And uh, I still, in my heart, believe that these types of clues and these types of statements made by witnesses need to be thoroughly followed up on. And uh, I honestly believe that uh, the players that we're talking about, uh, David Mack and Amir Muhammad, are somehow involved in this case. 
and the department it, time and time again has avoided the truth mm -hmm. and when you add everything up what other uh, reason could there be the reason being is because they do not want to expose to the public that Los Angeles police officers were involved in the conspiracy to kill Biggie Smalls. The most amazing thing in this whole story is that Officer David Mack and Officer Rafael Perez have never been questioned in connection with the Biggie Smalls murder. Neither has Harry Billups, a.k.a. Amal Mohammed, who we tried to contact through his lawyer. If nothing else, their names should be cleared. The question now is with Tupac and Biggie dead, will the killing machine carry on? There was a news report that Suge Knight had threatened Snoop Dogg, seen here together in happier days. Snoop apparently is now frightened for his life. We wondered if this document had anything to do with it. After a concert at Universal Studios, Snoop Dogg was attacked, kicked and punched by people working for death row. When asked by one of the deputies if he knew who had killed Tupac Shakur, Snoop said it was the man sitting next to Tupac. When asked if he meant Suge Knight, Snoop replied affirmatively. Suge Knight's prison has come back, giving us permission to film. But I'm having problems with Death Row, who I'm having to negotiate with to interview Suge Knight. I'm dealing with this man, Reggie Jr., seen here second left, who's been running Death Row since Suge Knight's been in prison. Reggie Jr. is the son of Reggie Sr., who we'd so much admired and interviewed in Compton. Reggie Jr. had followed in his father's footsteps and also became a police officer before running death row. I remembered what Hackey had said about Reggie Jr. They'd served as Compton police officers together. If Reggie and I ever met one-on-one, -on -one, I think it would probably be who's going to draw first. The other unfortunate thing was that Reggie didn't seem to be a great fan of my films. Because I don't want none of this Heidi Feist bullshit tape that you did, where you go and the, the whole thing was to show how y'all were so you were so slick to get to Heidi, and, and everybody around around Heidi was bumbling fools. And if you don't say that's how your documentary went on Heidi Feist, then you're not an honest man. And well, I hope that this will be. I don't want that to be. I hope this will be a much better film than the Heidi Flies film. I I I hope so as well. Oh, you thought it was really well, I'm bad. Pointed, I did say that. My whole point is, don't use us to get that type no. of work done. No, I if mean, you just be straight with us, okay. and we'll tell you what we can and can't do. Well, a well, lot of things we don't mind speaking. We don't like speaking on the Tupac thing because that's an unfortunate thing that happened. We know Unfortunately, that Reggie was insisting that a death row representative attend the interview. I mean, I would gladly take him in there, and I, you know. It's just, uh, well, that's well, not my decision. Okay, well, see what you can do to help him get approved. And if you can't, then um, you can go. But I can assure you, Mr. Knight, or any any guys that's, a, that's a, I can probably even say any guys that's black in the prison won't be speaking, won't be speaking to you. Why, well, really? I guarantee you that. <laughs> Unhappily, we never did reach agreement with Reggie, but as we still had the prison's permission to film, we decided to go anyway, even though Suge Knight had refused. The camera person dropped out for self-preservation, but the rest of us had overseas passports, so we went anyway. This is Mule Creek State Prison, a maximum security facility in Northern California where Suge Knight has served the majority of his sentence. This is Suge Knight's recreation yard, Yard C. Should we try and find Mr. Suge Knight? Well, we can go out and try to find just about anybody that you want to talk to out here. Oh, yeah. The immediate problem we had was in actually finding Suge Knight, as we hadn't arranged an interview. Well, it's a nice day. I did! Suge's not a worker. He should be out here somewhere. So. Okay. I don't know what the warden said, but Suge Knight agreed to do a short interview. I wondered what Suge Knight would want to talk about in this, his first filmed interview at Mule Creek Prison. He's been in for five years. I heard he was on the warpath for Snoop Dogg. Hi. Oh, okay. 
My cameraman seemed a bit jittery. It was like he wasn't there, dreaming of some tropical island in a better world somewhere else. I noticed he seemed to be looking around for a possible route of escape. Let me talk to you one more time. Okay. We want to benefit from some kids out there, too. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? I don't know if you talked to anybody from my office. Do you ever talk to anybody from my yeah. office? Yeah. Spoke to Reggie. Right. You yeah. talked to Reggie. I mean, I don't have to do this. No, I know you don't. But I do this because, you know, we build a piece positive for the kids. Okay. So so I want is there's no slander and funny stuff. It's probably, what's the, what you want to ask me before we get on that? Well, paper? I said, I, you know, I gather that you didn't really want to talk very much about Tupac. Mm-hmm. I agreed to no slander and funny stuff and to ask Suge Knight about his message to the kids. And so what is the special message you would like to send to the kids? Like I said before, when you first came in, if it's any time it could be anything positive to help with the kids, well, if they can see from if it's my mistakes or the next person's mistakes, we don't have to make the same mistakes, I'm all open for it. Well, and what would you and what would you like to say to them about the mistakes? About the mistakes that with I, I, I was you know everybody makes mistakes, and you got in the media what's going on today for is a lot of kids saying they get they they input off of rap music or rap artists or or entertainment. I think um, some of that can be true, but most of it. Uh, I would like them to understand that majority, not majority, basically all the artists who's involved in, if they get in trouble, these guys have record companies back them that would get them high power lawyers. They have high power lawyers, nine out of 10, they would never ever, you know, come to the penitentiary. But the guys in the inner city, if they get in trouble, they have, uh, what we call a public tender, a public defender, which is they got not gonna have the best, and they, and, go, to and they go to prison for a long time. So they long should time. model themselves on rap stars with big lawyers. No, they shouldn't. I and mean, besides that, you know, you have um, certain individuals who's artists, and they might get in trouble. They might do a few things, but. They like in, they well known names and they inform it for the police. They snitches. Snoop Dogg. And if they get in trouble, they gonna get a free pass. Like if you hear about it, um, there's several artists that would never ever come to prison. No matter what they do, you hear about it getting caught if it's firearm, getting caught with drugs, doing this, doing that. Like who? Well, put it to you like this. When you look at it and you think about it. You see that you watch the news, you follow the people's trials, people's court cases, or you follow the what you hear, word of mouth, what you hear about the streets, about the guy getting 25 years because he had a um, two dollar piece of crack cocaine on him, or a guy got 10 years because he had a firearm on him. Then you get a guy for us if it's a uh, it's not personal, so I don't want to make it seem like okay. I'm slandering these guys' names. Or, or if you hear about a lot of the artists, used to be someone used to be on death row, someone on other labels. You might hear them um, getting caught with drugs, getting caught with a gun, stab somebody, do those type of crimes. They're not gonna come to prison. One of the reasons they're not gonna come. Like to Snoop. Or... Well, Snoop would never come. I mean, Snoop was on. You know, we'd be the murder trial for him, but then he was on probation. Then he got caught with two ounces of marijuana. Then he got caught with guns. And each time, it's nothing. They're not going to violate him. Because for the street guys, the street guys know what I'm talking about. There's no puzzle. I mean, if you get a guy that constantly getting in trouble and never going to come to prison, that's because he's an informant. He's a rat, yeah. a snitch, yeah. you know. And they're more important to the police on the streets than in here because they let them know what's going on. They might say they sold by telling on three or four or five other guys. You know, I'm from Compton, and I'm, a rat is the lowest you can go. A rat will do anything. But you don't think Snoop was a rat? I mean, I don't want to make Alice, I don't want to, I don't need to put nobody out there. Okay. If, if I do that, it's like a form of telling. But for the street guys out there, they know. They know this guy never come to prison. They know the only way to keep out, stay out of prison is one way. And you look at it, 
I got nine years. The judge said he watched the tape 25 times. He couldn't tell if I kicked or just broke it up. The victim said I didn't know, but I still got nine years. I know I was going to have to pay a debt to society before it's come to prison because if you come from the inner city, you come from the ghetto, and you act up off that block, you'll come to prison sooner or later. If you don't come to prison, there's only a few things, you know, you got to be working with the police. Suge Knight is leaving prison in one month's time. He denies any involvement in the murders. Snoop Dogg is terrified, though. He has trebled his security guards. Kevin Hackey has applied for a special concealed weapons license, citing Suge Knight as the reason. The problem we have with this case is we don't have anyone willing to come forward and testify to it. If you knew who killed Tupac, would you tell the police? Absolutely not. I mean, because you know I don't Why know. not? Because it's, it's not my job. I don't get paid to solve homicides. I don't get paid... You see yourself in 20 years. If God give me breath for 20 more years, I see myself changing the world. Because my thought patterns are so opposite of what's the norm. Really? So I would have to change the world or I have to be changed by the world. He wasn't no, just no rap, he was an activist. This ain't no democracy. Pac knew that the elite was paying the government, the elite on the government, on the president, everybody else. Pac was talking about that shit and they didn't want to hear that shit. They didn't want no young black brother telling these black people in the ghetto that your strings is being pulled by a committee of 300. Moving on. Suge had a look on his face that he knew something was getting ready to go down. There was no doubt that Suge Knight orchestrated the hit on Pac. Now I want to go back to the first hit that took place in New York with Biggie and Puff Daddy. The Tupac article had me pissed off, you know what I'm saying? Because first of all, he dissed my man, said my man turned his back on him, and I know for a fact that didn't happen, you know what I'm saying? And like the rumors that's spreading is on some tip like we set him up, you know what I'm saying? And that's crazy. Puff Biggie knew exactly who shot Pac. I want you to take a close look at Puff Daddy's reaction. He's guilty as hell. Tupac article had me pissed off, you know what I'm saying? Because first of all, he dissed my man, said my man turned his back on him, and I know for a fact that didn't happen, you know what I'm saying? And like the rumors that's spreading is on some tip 